see you all here. Delighted to have such a tremendously large turnout for the inaugural session of our Asia Beyond the Headlines seminar. I'm Karen Thornber. I'm the new director of the Asia Center here at Harvard University. And it's my great pleasure to uh, welcome uh, on stage this afternoon uh, four uh, terrific, tremendous scholars who are going to uh, enlighten us as to one belt, one road, in historical and global context. This is only the first of what we hope will be an ongoing seminar series here at the Asia Center, where we tackle critical issues, urgent contemporary issues that are facing Asia uh, writ large, or at least Asia beyond the borders of a single country. So I'm just going to spend a brief moment or two introducing our four speakers uh, for today, and then I'll turn the uh, podium over uh, to uh, Liz Perry, Professor Perry, uh, who will introduce the uh, intellectual substance of the panel and get us started this afternoon. So Professor Perry is Henry Rosofsky Professor of Government and Director of the Harvard Yenching Institute. She has special expertise in the politics of China, and her research is focused on popular pr protest, grassroots politics in modern and contemporary China. She's the author, co-author, or editor of numerous books, including Beyond Regimes, China and India Compared, which is forthcoming, What is the Best Kind of History uh, in Chinese, uh, published in 2015, uh, Mao's Invisible Hand, The Political Foundations of Adaptive Governments in China, 2011. Seems every other year there's a, a new book from <laughs> Professor Perry. Uh, our second speaker today will be Professor Mark Elliott, who is Vice Provost of International Affairs. He's also Mark Schwartz Professor of Chinese and Inter-Asia History here at Harvard as well. As Vice Provost, Professor Elliott oversees and works to advance international academic initiatives extending the global reach of Harvard's research and teaching initiatives. As a scholar, Professor Elliott is an authority on the last four centuries of Chinese history, but in particular the Qing period. His research encompasses the history of relations between China and its nomadic frontier with special attention to questions of ethnicity and empire. His first book was The Manchu Wei, The Eight Banners and Ethnic Identity in Late, um, in late Imperial China. It's a pioneering study in the new Qing history, an approach emphasizing the imprint of inner Asia traditions on China's last imperial state. He's also the author of the highly regarded Emperor Qianlong, Son of Heaven, Man of the World. Uh, following Professor Elliott this afternoon, we'll have Professor Michael Zoni, who's Professor of Chinese History and who's also Director of the Fairbank Center for Chinese Studies here at Harvard. Professor Zoni is primarily a social historian of late imperial and modern China. His research uses a combination of traditional textual study and contemporary fieldwork to explore the local history of Southeast China from the Ming Dynasty through the 20th century. His books include Everyday Politics in Late Imperial China, which is forthcoming, uh, Cold War Island from 2008, Practicing Kinship from 2002, and he's also the editor of the forthcoming Blackwell volume, uh, Companion to Chinese History. And finally, wrapping up our discussion today will be Dr. William Overholt, who's a senior fellow here at the Harvard Asia Center. Dr. Overholt is the author or co-author of seven books, including Renminbi Rising, The Emergence of a New Global Monetary System of 2015, Asia, America, and the Transformation of Geopolitics from 2008, uh, the Rise of China uh, back in the 1990s and, and other such pioneering texts. He's previously served as president of the Fung Global Institute in Hong Kong and was a senior research fellow at the Ash Center at the Harvard Kennedy School. He served as well as the director of the Center for the Asia Pacific Policy at Rand Corporation, among many other positions. And it really is to Bill that we owe our greatest thanks for organizing today's panel, uh, thanking the speakers, making sure that every, everyone was on um, board with the topic. And Bill also was responsible for getting us uh, Ambassador Don Gregg, who's going to be featured at our second iteration of this seminar series, Asia Beyond the Headlines, on October 27th. And I think we'll get a bigger room for that, uh, that event. <laughs> um, so. We uh, absolutely need to need to thank uh, Bill for that as well. There will be a small reception uh, following today's uh, presentations, today's seminar. 
although there are a lot of people, so the food might go really quickly, but feel free to, there's also going to be some wine there, um, but feel free just to uh, hang around, uh, talk with your colleagues, and uh, continue the discussions that uh, have started here. And with that, I'll turn it over to Liz. Thank you very much, Karen, for inspiring this new series for the Harvard Asia uh, Center, Asia Beyond the Headlines. And let me also echo Karen's thanks to Bill for pulling this uh, inaugural kickoff session uh, for this new series. Um, I'm primarily chair uh, today. That's my primary function. Um, so I'll just say a little bit by way of introduction. Um, we have three knowledgeable panels who will put the One Belt, One Road uh, project into historical and uh, comparative perspective. Uh, um, I think uh, the first speaker will be um, Professor Elliott, uh, who will talk about the One Belt, One Road initiative in terms of its connections, similarities, dissimilarities to the ancient Silk Road. Uh, next will be Professor Michael Sony, a Ming historian, who will talk about the maritime uh, route here. For those of you, I don't know how visible it is here, but uh, if you can't see it too clearly here, let me recommend that you look at the Merrick's website of our colleague in Berlin, uh, Sebastian Heilmann. Uh, and on the website of Merrick's, this uh, think tank in Berlin, you will find this lovely map about the One Belt, One Road initiative. And you'll also find a number of really fascinating papers about the One Belt, One Road uh, initiative. So as you can perhaps or perhaps not see, there's both a maritime component to it down here and an overland component with many, many uh, branches uh, off it. And, um, and then uh, our third panelist will be uh, Dr. Overholt, who will put this project in a somewhat uh, more recent perspective, comparing it to the international order that the United States and the West built after the Second World War the form, in the form of uh, economic institutions. Now, first, a quick word about terminology. The Chinese uh, term for this project, One Belt, One Road, um, Idailu, has remained the same throughout its lifetime. Uh, but the English translation of it has changed. So in 2013, when it was first announced in China, it, Idailu was known in English as One Belt, One Road, and the acronym for it was OBOR, OBOR which sounded perfectly fine to me. Um, but apparently, it didn't sound so good to some uh, of China's uh, detractors who said, one belt, one road sounds like one way and only a Chinese way. And so the Bureau of Translation in China decided to change the English rendering of the term. So officially now, it is not one belt, one road in English. Officially, it is the Belt Road Initiative. And it now has the acronym not of OBAR, but the perhaps cheesy acronym of BRI uh, instead. <laughs> um, anyway, um, you should uh, feel free to call it OBAR or BRI as uh, you wish. When this uh, was first announced, it was immediately understood as a highly ambitious and also somewhat controversial flagship foreign policy initiative of the PRC. It is an attempt to construct a transnational and cross-regional integration project that is driven through the financing of basic infrastructure. All kinds of infrastructure, new highways, new railways, new seaports, new airports, new power grids, other infrastructure that will better connect China to South and Southeast Asia, Africa, the Middle East, and Europe. Uh, nearly 70 countries so far have signed on as BRI partner countries. Over 1 trillion US dollars has already been pledged uh, toward this uh, project in the form of infrastructure investment on the part of China and its uh, partner countries. Much of that uh, investment will be funneled through the Asia uh, Infrastructure Investment Bank, of which, of course, China is the founding and anchor 
partner. According uh, to the PRC, BRI will affect some 4.4 billion people and generate trade worth trillions of dollars within the next few years. BRI is being promoted as a project that will encompass two-thirds of the world's population, half of global GDP, and 75% of known energy reserves, not a trivial matter in light of China's increasing dependence on imports of energy from abroad. The idea here is to create a new kind of globalization that will supersede the post-World War II order of the Western, especially American, dominated international institutions. It was recently characterized in the New York Times as a more audacious version of the Marshall Plan, uh, the plan to rebuild uh, Germany and Europe at large after the Second World War. But some commentators within China have le uh, likened Bri not only to the old Silk Road or to the voyages of Zheng He that we'll be talking about today, but also to the ancient concept of tianxia, or everything under heaven, and the tributary system of imperial China. In their view, the initiative at heart is as much cultural as it is economic or strategic. When President Xi Jinping presided over an international conference on Bri in Beijing just a few months ago, there were many luminaries who attended uh, not least was Vladimir Putin of Russia, but also the United States, Japan, UK, Australia, Germany, countries large and small uh, sent representatives to this conference. But one country that was located, if you look at the map there, right at the center of uh, the Brie project was notably absent, and that was India. India has very serious reservations about Brie. In fact, I've heard much more uh, about Bri on my travels to India than I have about it on my travels to China. For one thing, of course, there are deep, long-standing uh, distrusts uh, between India and China dating back to the border war of 1962. For another thing, the populist, nationalist sentiments uh, that have been revived in recent years by Prime Minister Modi and the BJP have fanned the flames of smoldering nationalism. For another thing, the current uh, trade imbalance between China and India is worrisome from the Indian perspective. India exports nearly $9 billion uh, of uh, goods to China each year, which sounds like a lot until you realize that China last year exported over $60 billion to India. And when you look at the nature of that trade, it's even more worrisome to the Indians. They are exporting raw materials to China. China is exporting uh, finished electronic products, computers, and so forth to India. India is particularly concerned about one part of Bri, and that is the part that is known as the Pakistan Economic Corridor. The China-Pakistan Economic Corridor is the part of Bree that links Pakistan's deep sea port of Gwadar all the way up to Kashgar in Xinjiang via a network of new railroads, highways, and pipelines. China is currently pumping investment into this part of Bri at an astounding uh, rate. Uh, already, it has poured more into this project than the entire preceding 40 years of foreign investment that Pakistan had received. This is not only an economic concern to India, it's also a geopolit geopolitical and strategic worry. To guard against potential terrorism along this route, China currently is providing more than 30,000 armed uh, security guards. Pakistan is supplying more than 15,000 armed guards. Some of the territory that is traversed by the corridor in Pakistan-occupied Kashmir and, pa and Jammu is also claimed, of course, by India. India worries not only about the economic and the strategic potential of this uh, program, it also fears the cultural resurgence and potential cultural hegemony of China in the region. And one year after China announced OBOR, India announced its own counter project, so-called Project Mausam, 
which uh, correctly was widely interpreted as an effort to compete in the cultural realm with OBOR by stressing that it is the Indian Ocean rather than the Pacific Ocean, let alone the South China Sea, um, that we should be looking at as the key ancient maritime route that uh, uh, should be built upon for a contemporary resurgence of cultural Asian identity. As the Indian Ministry of Culture explains it, quote, countries along the Indian Ocean have shared links with each other for millennia. Project Mao Sam seeks to transcend present day national and ethnic borders, documenting and celebrating the common cultural values and economic ties of the Indian Ocean world, unquote. Um, but um, whereas Brie has attracted over a trillion dollars in investment, uh, Project Mao Sam has attracted not trillions, not billions, barely millions, uh, just over $3 million uh, from the Indian government. And when India went to UNESCO seeking uh, transnational heritage cultural status for its project, uh, it was denied it thanks to PRC pressure in the United Nations. So does this mean that we and China can just discount India or others' discomfort with uh, OBOR or with BRI? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, we're talking here, of course, about China, India, Pakistan, three nuclear powers. Currently, uh, the United States actually conducts more joint military exercises with India than with any other country in the world, even though it's not one of our military allies. And India is actually the largest uh, purchaser of American arms in the developing world. The very recent Doklam border dispute between China and India uh, has come, of course, quite close to open military conflict. And this suggests, I think, that OBOR, unless it's handled very carefully, very sensitively by all parties concerned, um, has the very dangerous potential of inflaming longstanding rivalries between the two ancient giants of Asia, both of which, of course, are great millennial civilizations with justifiable pride in their ancient history and heritage that is being, in both uh, places, rekindled by contemporary nationalist currents. So we're looking today at a potentially transformative global historical uh, event uh, with uh, enormous uh, hopeful uh, potential, hopeful dimensions, but at the same time, we are looking at a program that is fraught with pitfalls and perils for China and its neighbors as well. And I think uh, the uh, panelists today will present to you uh, probably uh, a rather complex picture of the contemporary scene and the historical parallels uh, from which, to which it may be compared. So let me first turn to Professor Elliott for some comments on the Silk Road. Thank you, Liz, uh, for uh, providing terrific context for uh, the remarks that I will make, and, and I'm sure my, my colleagues uh, will as well. And thank you, uh, everybody, for, for coming this afternoon. If you're still standing in the door, um, I would say to crowd in more, except that I don't know where you would crowd in to. Uh, but maybe if everybody just moved over six inches around the doorways, <laughs> that would make room for, for people who are s still in the, uh, uh, in the lobbies there. Uh, I w had planned to uh, circulate in the middle, but I think given the, the, the size of the crowd, I'll, I'll stay here behind, uh, behind the podium. The, the chief message, uh, and I'm going to talk for about 15, 15 minutes or so, the chief message I want to convey about the Silk Road uh, today and providing some historical uh, background on it is that the Silk Road uh, has served as a canvas or a screen upon which uh, many generations of uh, scholars and uh, uh, explorers and writers and politicians have, and musicians and artists have projected uh, their own thoughts about uh, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the ways that connect the East, so-called, and the West. Uh, we see this in 
as I'll show you uh, in, in some images I have. Uh, in scholarship, we see it in, uh, in art and music. Uh, we certainly see it uh, in politics. And the basic argument that I want to make is that uh, one belt, one road, Idailu, or BRI, or whatever uh, name we want to uh, call it. Um, and I'm, I'm curious, actually, maybe we can get to this during the uh, Q&A, uh, if the Translation Bureau has also codified what Idailu should be called in French, in German, in Japanese, in Russian, and every other language out there uh, in which Idai Ilu is going to be translated uh, because uh, the, uh, the, the use of, of articles and, and, and prepositions and so forth are, will vary greatly among languages and the nuances that we find between One Belt, One Road and Belt Road Initiative may be lost in, in other languages, but we can maybe come back to that. So as many of you will know, uh, the Silk Road uh, historically is traced back to uh, roughly uh, the second century BCE when, uh, the, uh, when Emperor Wu, uh, Han Wudi of the Han Dynasty, uh, sent an emissary uh, west uh, to the Yuezhi uh, to seek uh, military alliance against their common enemy, uh, the Xiongnu. Uh, and uh, the uh, image here we have from a mural at the, from the caves in Dunhuang, uh, one of uh, the most famous sites, if not the most single famous site along uh, the Silk Road in China anyway, uh, shows uh, Zhang Tian uh, about to set out uh, on uh, his uh, mission westward. It, it, he made two trips, uh, uh, each took a few years. Uh, the second one, uh, he brought back uh, these amazing uh, so-called blood-sweating horses from the Fergana Valley, which were uh, later to be instrumental in securing Chinese victory over uh, the Xiongnu. Uh, the opening that Zhang Qian made, he left with silk. Silk, of course, was at the time the, uh, a monopoly of, uh, of China. It was only produced in, in China. Uh, domestication of the silkworm was a technique that had been invented in China. Uh, and he brought silk uh, in exchange for uh, horses or whatever other sort of uh, resources he could get uh, to secure alliances. And the story goes then that the silk made its way further and further west. Uh, and uh, this opened up then uh, the commercial exchanges that linked Rome uh, and the Middle East ultimately with China, uh, and then later on uh, Korea, as well as Japan, and with the maritime routes, uh, also uh, Vietnam. Uh, this other parts of the Silk Road uh, would be linked to India, as we have already heard from Professor Perry. Uh, in the modern context, uh, this is a complicated relationship, certainly in historic terms, the transmission of Buddhism uh, from India uh, north uh, through uh, what's now Xinjiang uh, to China uh, was one of the most important cultural movements ever in Chinese history. Uh, and it transformed uh, everything that we know about uh, Chinese thought, literature, language, uh, pictorial representations, sculpture, clothing, music, you name it. Uh, it was not uh, unaffected by uh, the uh, transmission of, of Buddhism from India to China. That happened on the Silk Road. Uh, so the role of India on the Silk Road historically is certainly crucial, and the absence of uh, uh, an Indian representative at uh, the meeting uh, that was held in May is definitely something that uh, deserves careful, uh, careful thought. As you can see from this map, and uh, this is just one of any number of maps that one might pull off the, the internet or find in books, uh, there was never any one Silk Road. Uh, there were always many Silk Roads. Uh, in, in plural, of course, we don't have a plural for uh, Sucho Drulu. It uh, is singular and plural at the same time. But in its origins, it was definitely plural. The term Silk Road uh, will uh, be familiar to uh, you from the 19th century. This is when the term is invented uh, by a German uh, geographer, uh, Ferdinand von Richthofen. Uh, he uh, coins the term in an article published in 1877, uh, and it's very clear uh, from the title, Über der Zentralasiatischen Seidenstraße, that this is a plural for him. He thought of it in uh, the plural. Later on, it gets singularized and pluralized uh, as people want. And Richthofen uh, saw uh, in his uh, travels and uh, his explorations 
uh, evidence of uh, ancient trade routes connecting East and West. And it was in this article that he first put forward the idea that it was silk primarily that was the uh, motor, if you will, of uh, the uh, economic interests that tied East and West together, uh, that it was silk uh, that moved back and forth. Traders moved with the silk, uh, religion moved with the silk, uh, material goods moved with the silk, uh, vegetables and fruits, uh, printing, paper, all sorts of things moved along the silk roads that were opened by, uh, the, uh, uh, by the Han Dynasty uh, back in the second century BC. Uh, depending on the rise and fall of empires and strong states, the Silk Road thereby uh, either waned or waxed uh, and continued until uh, the Age of Discovery when uh, maritime uh, routes uh, eclipsed permanently the importance of continental trade on the Silk Road and the Silk Road fell into decline for a few centuries only to be rediscovered by Europeans uh, in uh, Central Asia. Uh, and uh, what, Eastern Eurasia in, in the 19th century. A lot of that narrative now is, we know, uh, probably doesn't quite hold up, but that is the basic story that von Richthofen told. Uh, the story uh, was passed along uh, from s scholar to scholar, from, from explorer to explorer, mainly in Europe for uh, most of the 19th and early 20th centuries. Uh, and the names here will be familiar to many people, I think. Uh, Sven Hedin, uh, a Swedish uh, explorer and geographer. Uh, not quite an archaeologist, although he would probably like to claim to have been an archaeologist. A student of Richthofen's uh, who followed his teacher's, uh, uh, the suggestions that his teacher had made, uh, took some of those maps and went out and made some important discoveries that uh, uh, gave truth to uh, some of the claims that von Richthofen had made about routes that had been later covered up uh, by sand where uh, uh, deserts had uh, uh, come into being, uh, where formerly there had been water and there had been very active, uh, there had been uh, uh, towns and, and um, uh, caravanserai and, and, and so forth. So that kind of lent some uh, reality to the notion of, of the Silk Road. Uh, another famous figure associated with the Silk Road, the historical Silk Road, Oral Stein, uh, a uh, uh, naturalized British uh, uh, explorer uh, and uh, archaeologist uh, who uh, is uh, credited uh, for better or for worse with uh, the uh, uh, Don Juan Caves, uh, the Mogao Ku, uh, which he visited for the first time in 1900. And uh, a lot of what he took away is now in the British Library. Uh, and uh, uh, he and uh, others who came after him, uh, such as, uh, again, some of the, this is a, a colorized uh, photograph by Stein of some of the sites that were, uh, that were found that had been covered over by sand. Paul Pelio is another one uh, who visited uh, Dun Huang and other sites on the Silk Road. There were Germans, there were Russians, there were Japanese who went out uh, and uh, moved along the Silk Road. Uh, lending uh, as they came back uh, and wrote up their accounts, uh, a lot of romance, uh, a lot of exoticism, uh, maps, uh, beautiful objects and texts. I have an example or two to show you in just a second uh, that uh, brought this really uh, to life. Uh, Harvard was not left out of this story, I want to uh, uh, emphasize. And the uh, uh, first historian of Asian art at Harvard, uh, Langdon Warner, uh, also went out on uh, the Silk Road. Uh, and uh, uh, on behalf of the Fogg Museum, uh, came back with a statue, a bodhisattva, uh, taken from uh, this cave in, uh, in Dunhuang, Cave 328. If you have been to Dunhuang, uh, you will get the full story from the guide who will tell you all about what happened there, and uh, that this is now uh, in uh, the Harvard Museum, which indeed it is. You can see it on the second floor. Uh, so this is all part of what we think of when we think of the Silk Road. We think of silk uh, moving around. Uh, we think of here, this is a contract uh, showing uh, the sale of a slave girl in exchange for silk. Silk holds its value quite well, so it functioned as a kind of currency, uh, as well as uh, being the object on which uh, people uh, painted beautiful paintings. They were used in decorations. They were used for clothing, obviously. Uh, and many other things as well. 
in terms of what moved on the Silk Road, uh, here musical instruments are shown. Scripts move back on and forth on, on the Silk Road. Uh, this is an example of Cotanese script, which ultimately derives from Syriac script in the Mediterranean and would later develop into the scripts used for Mongolian and for Manchu. So on the Silk Road, we have scripts moving from the Mediterranean all the way to the Pacific. Uh, so there is definitely movement along the Silk Road, make no mistake. Getting along on the Silk Road wasn't always easy. Uh, camels were the preferred uh, mode of transport then, as they were uh, uh, just a few years ago when I went out on the Silk Road myself. Uh, we have uh, pictures here from the Dunhuang Caves then. Now the Silk Road has become quite heavily touristed. How many of you have been, say, to Dunhuang or someplace along the Silk Road? Yeah, so that's a, a pretty good indication. That's at least a third of everybody here. Uh, this used to be like the far most exotic thing you could ever do, uh, and now uh, it really has kind of become a standard route, uh, and uh, the, uh, the means of transport have changed <laughs> for sure. But some of the same things are still for sale. Uh, you'll still find silk for sale. Uh, you'll still find animals for sale. You'll still find fruits. These would have come originally from Persia. Uh, uh, these are for sale. Uh, but you'll also find websites with hotels and, and uh, explanations of what to see, virtual caves, and, and all the rest. Uh, so this has become now, a uh, uh, again, part integrated into the uh, international uh, tourist uh, network, uh, another way in which uh, images of the exotic images of uh, the East, if you will, uh, have been uh, projected and portrayed, and no, no, no less among uh, Chinese tourists as among tourists from other parts of the world. In fact, by far the majority of people now visiting uh, Dunhuang and other kinds of sites on the Silk Road are, uh, are Chinese. Musically, uh, the Silk Road from 1980, when the NHK did its landmark uh, show on the Silk Road, the first uh, joint venture between uh, a Japanese and a Chinese uh, television production company. Uh, huge hit, uh, the, uh, the music from this has sold millions and millions. It's inspired uh, Yo-Yo Ma and other people. Yo-Yo Ma, our own graduate, we come back to a Harvard theme. It must be the vice provost in me coming out and making all of these <laughs> remarks. And now we have One Belt, One Road. Now we have Ida Ilu. What, how is this related to the Silk Road? So when I first back in 2013, heard about One Belt, Run Road and how this was going to be a revival of the Silk Road, I thought, give me a break. I thought, this, this, no, this has got nothing to do with the Silk Road. The Silk Road itself is the invention of a 19th century German. Why is the Chinese government interested in resurrecting this transparently colonialist idea for its own purposes? What, what are they thinking? And obviously, I'm a lousy politician. Uh, because this idea has definitely taken hold, I think. Uh, my, my fellow panelists and those of you here may, may disagree, but it seems to me, I guess if you put $1 trillion into something, it acquires a kind of material reality that's hard to overlook. It's hard to ignore. And the success, uh, I think I would, I would regard it as a success, again, we'll hear other opinions, of the May meeting, uh, at which Xi Jinping presided, uh, uh, is a, a testimony to the fact that this, this idea is going gonna, is gonna to be with us for quite some time. Uh, I, I think it, it again, my, my sense here is that it's very different from, say, the China dream. It's very different from other sorts of uh, tifa that we have uh, seen in the past. Uh, it uh, represents a, a pretty ambitious, I mean, the numbers that, that Professor Perry put out for us shows the scale of thinking here. This is not small in, uh, uh, the, the vision is, is, is not a small vision at all. Uh, and even if it is predicated upon uh, this uh, 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 cultural imaginary that began in, in Europe, uh, I guess I would say that it has acquired enough of a worldwide patina, a worldwide appeal that it works as well in China as it does in Japan or in Latin America or North America. So it maybe it doesn't really make that much difference that uh, you know, what, its, what its origins uh, really, uh, really were. Again, the Su Chodralu idea back in 1980, uh, I first went on the Silk Road in 1983, I guess it was, 
the Sichuan Zhilu was a, a transparent uh, um, uh, borrowing from, it was a translation. There was no translation bureau, I don't think, then. Maybe there was. You would know. Which, 80? 80, 82, oh, yeah. 83, oh, there yeah. was a translation sure. bureau. Yeah. Well, I don't think that they bothered about what to, <laughs> what to call the, the Silk Road then. In, uh, in, in, in Japanese, it was called the Shuduku Rodo. So, you know, uh, so you, you have the invention of this term uh and it has become totally naturalized and, uh, and adopted. Uh, the, the meeting here, this is, uh, shows uh, Xi with, uh, with uh, uh, Putin and other leaders, uh, demonstrates uh, the ability he had to get everybody to come and mark uh, the uh, the event and the important uh, development that this I think represents in the way that China approaches the rest of the world. Um, other maps here uh, show some of the places where uh, the new Silk Road the uh, uh, will will go. Uh, does it matter that not all of these places were originally on the Silk Road? That Moscow was certainly very far <laughs> from any, any place that anybody who went on the historic Silk Road ever visited? It probably doesn't really matter. You know, does it matter that the Panama Canal is not on the Silk Road? Probably doesn't really matter. Uh, because if I'm in Latin America or if I'm somewhere in East Africa, uh, where we at least have a bit more of a plausible a claim to be made uh, for uh, early historical contact. Uh, I might want a part of uh, uh, the Silk Road pie myself. <laughs> Another map showing, uh, and here's the, uh, uh, the Merix map that I agree is uh, definitely worth uh, downloading and putting on your, on your computer. Uh, and again, there are many different metrics that you can use uh, to show what this means. This is the high-speed railway that's going to be built uh, before we get one between New York and Boston, there will be one between Paris and <laughs> Peking. I, I guarantee you. Uh, and uh, this is leading to all sorts of interesting questions about whether China is the world's new colonial power and so forth, the way that this is tied in with China's interests in energy resources in other parts of the world. Things we'll get into later on. Come back, coming back finally, let me just end with Jiang Qian. So we know that historically China did, does not typically make alliances with other countries. It's not the way that Chinese foreign policy typically has run. There are many experts in, in the room on Chinese foreign policy. There are exceptions to be drawn to this statement, but I think broadly speaking, this is something that we would probably say is true. An interesting exception to that, though, was this original mission of Jiang Qian out to the Yuezhi to seek an alliance against the Xiongnu. It's interesting to me that in the second century BCE, Han Wu Di decided that his strategic opening was going to be to the West. And we are seeing, uh, I won't say a repeat of that, but there are definitely, in my view, echoes of that early move westward by uh, the first uh, or the second Chinese em empire uh, to extend its, its uh, strategic reach to other parts of the world, to position it in a better way way against its, uh, its, its enemies or its perceived enemies, uh, or at least its rivals if we don't want to use the word enemy. Uh, the degree to which uh, One Belt, One Road, the, the BRI initiative, is uh, doing something of the same thing, I will leave for others to say, but uh, I would uh, ask you to think about if Jiang Chen were around today, what would he say, uh, what, would, what would he do? Would he be uh, an ambassador for Xi Jinping today? Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Mark. Our next speaker is Michael Sony. Thank you. It is, I think, a very curious thing that after Xi Jinping, the single individual most associated with the Belt and Road Initiative is a 14th century Muslim eunuch from Kunming. <laughs> this occurred to me uh, yesterday as I read the New York Times editorial, in the, fi the financial section editorial, uh, in which uh, the name Xi Jinping appears two or three times, and the name Zheng He appears 
five or six times. Those with greater computer skills than I will, I think, actually be able to confirm this. In terms of individuals associated with this project, of course Xi Jinping comes out on top, but the next is Zheng He. In the uh, May 2017 meeting to which both Liz and Mark have referred, I will actually make one comment about that meeting, uh, about the acronyms and the changing acronyms uh, related to this project. We've heard about OBOR, we've heard about BRI. Uh, this meeting, of course, was the Belt and Road Forum, the BARF meeting. <laughs> uh, any of you who are able to produce for me a BARF Chu Xi Zheng, I'll be very grateful. <laughs> In Xi Jinping's speech at the BARF Forum in May 2017, he mentioned only two or three individuals. And one of them, of course, was Zheng He. In the early 15th century, Zheng He, the famous Chinese navigator in the Ming Dynasty, made seven voyages to the Western Seas, a feat which is still remembered today. Uh, the pi these pioneers won their place in history, not as conquerors with warships, guns, or swords. Rather, they are remembered as friendly emissaries sailing treasure-loaded ships. Generation after generation, these travelers have built a bridge for peace and east-west cooperation. Given this strong association, and a, a simple Google search will prove this association. I may be exaggerating a little bit when I say he's the, the, the number two individual, but a simple Google search will, will prove what I'm saying is correct. Given this strong association, it struck me that it was worth exploring the relationship between the history of Zheng He, the historiography of Zheng He, and how Zheng He figures in, uh, one bell, in, in, in BRI initiatives. I will not, of course, suggest that studying the experience of Zheng He uh, can tell us everything about everything. It cannot answer all our questions about where one belt and one road are going. Um, I won't, uh, although I will say that it, 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 it is, um, so I won't say anything, for example, about what it can reveal about really one of the very pressing questions, which is what ultimately is the motivation or what are the key factors driving this project on the, on the Chinese side. The explicit motivations are, of course, motherhood issues. Right? Who can object to global prosperity uh, and global interconnectivity? But it's interesting that if you, if you review the literature, um, there's every other explanation under the sun being offered, many of them contradictory. Bri is, on the one hand, the tool that Xi Jinping needs to really push through meaningful economic reform, which is stalled by vested interests in China, but it's also a tool to get lots of rich contracts for more abundant state-owned enterprises that he needs to keep alive. Um, this is not really folk central to what I want to talk about today, but I will say as a side note, um, I do find the argument, uh, of all of these arguments, I do find the argument that, which is not much mentioned, that at the center of this is um, a desire to hedge against the risks of having over a trillion dollars in uh, U.S. debt. Uh, if I had a trillion dollars in U.S. debt, uh, I would want to invest it in something real, too. Um, in any case, Zheng is not going to help us figure out whether this is really what's going on. Um, I want to instead focus on the use of history, um, uh, the history, a particular aspect of history, as analogy, as model, and as rhetorical tool in the Chinese promotion of the Belt and Road Initiative. So I begin from the position that Zheng He is a main character, indeed the main character, uh, in a mythology that is being constructed uh, uh, and deployed in support of a political initiative today. Um, and I see Paul Cohen here, so of course I will mention that this is a, a sort of technique that I learned about from reading Paul's work. One of the things that's really interesting is we're actually seeing the mythology constructed before our very eyes um, in, a, in, a, in an interesting way. Obviously, narratives about Zheng He today are interested narratives. By that, I mean they are produced by specific actors in order to 
resonate with certain positions, in order to support certain positions, and in order to challenge other positions. What I want to do for the next 10 minutes or so is explore these narratives in relation to history. The purpose of this is, of course, not to show discrepancies, not to show inaccuracies, not to show where the myths diverge from what really happened, although inevitably I'm going to do quite a bit of that. My point, rather, is that by exploring these myths, um, we may be able to shed new light on the project, uh, its uh, motivations, the way it resonates within China, and the way it may unfold abroad. So um, I deliberately didn't make a PowerPoint of Zheng He because I knew I'd get stuck in the story of, of Zheng He. I'm going to assume that we all know something about him, and uh, those who don't will pull out their phones uh, and get the Wikipedia story. Uh, Zheng He, of course, uh, born in uh, the late uh, uh, 14th century in the early Ming Dynasty in 1371. Um, is a, uh, a, a close supporter and ally of the Yongle Emperor, uh, who he, for whom he proves himself in battle and then as a kind of um, uh, infrastructure, uh, or, uh, uh, organ do, doing infrastructural development in early 15th century China. Um, at the behest of the Yongle Emperor, his commander, he undertakes seven interna international voyages uh, between 1402 and 1433, um, uh, he didn't get to America. Let's just set that one aside. He didn't get to Venice. Let's set that one aside. But he, you know, he, he traveled a lot of places. Um, and in fact, the places that he traveled map very clearly onto the officially produced maps of the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, these were, the, the voyages were the largest naval expeditions in human history to that point. In terms of their size, in terms of their scope, one of the expeditions for which reasonably reliable numbers exist suggests that as many as 27,000 soldiers were aboard Zheng He's fleet. They were very much driven by imperial initiative. They were a personal pet project of the Yongle Emperor, and there's only one voyage that happened after the Yongle Emperor died and uh, it was clear that, that uh, once the initiative dried up, that there was no political support for the project. Uh, interestingly, and I think this may be especially interesting for uh, those of you uh, younger people in the audience who went to school in China, uh, for most of the last 500 years, Zheng He was basically forgotten. Uh, he was not a major figure uh, in uh, the Chinese historical tradition. His biography in the Ming history is 10 lines or so. He was resurrected in the early 20th century um, by reformers, in particular uh, Liang Qichao and, and Sun Yat-sen, who saw, and so the, the historiography of Zheng He is from start to finish a story of history being used for political purposes in the present. Liang, Liang Qichao and, and Sun Yat-sen, when they wrote about Zheng He, uh, wrote, were, were basically trying to salvage national pride. They were trying to say uh, uh, China in the past had the wealth and the power and the skills to be a world power uh, and, to do, and to do maritime exploring, exploration. And this is quite significant. There was a moral dimension to this historiography. Unlike Columbus and the European explorers, Zheng He went in peace. The voyages then stopped. And this became a central question for 20th century reformers. Why had China turned its back on the world? So I want to focus for the time remaining on two central issues in the uh, uh, Belt and Road mythology of Zheng He, derived from an earlier historiography of Zheng He from the early 20th century. And the two elements I want to focus on are, are first of all, that, uh, uh, chi that, that China's maritime expansion was peaceful. And secondly, that China, uh, after the Zheng He voyages, turned its back on the maritime world. Um, neither of these, I'm going to suggest very, very quickly, is close to historically accurate. What does it mean if Zheng He didn't go in peace? And what does it mean if China did not turn its back on the world? Um, so first of all, um, the Zheng He uh, missions fought 
a number of battles on the first, third, and fourth voyages. So on almost 50% of the voyages, there was large-scale warfare. Uh, I don't have time to get into the details, but rulers were overthrown. Rulers were kidnapped, brought back to Beijing, and executed. Puppet rulers were installed. Um, the, uh, the, these are the largest, as I, just to repeat, the largest military expeditions in the world at that time, up to that point. To quote the leading uh, Western language expert, uh, Zheng He's biography, Ed Dreyer, the ships of the voyage, the so-called treasure ships, were intended to ferry Chinese troops around the Indian Ocean in order to impress, or if need be, to overpower local authorities. The goal of this effort was neither conquest nor the promotion of trade, but the enforcement of the Chinese tributary system on the countries of the Indian Ocean. The tributary system for historians is a, is, a, is a concept much suspect. And indeed, thank you, Liz, for bringing this. Here's a whole article, article a whole edition of HJS, which suggests that there never was a tributary system. But um, if we substitute the word hegemony for the tributary system, we get a pretty good sense of what Zheng He was after. This is an episode of Chinese power projection. And it is the biggest episode of large-scale power projection uh, in history to that point. It is not about promoting commerce, and it is certainly not about conquest. But there is certainly an imperial logic behind these missions. So the story that Zheng He came in peace is historically problematic, even mythical. To the extent that the Zheng He voyage is now being deployed and serves as an analogy for the foreign policy stance of the Belt and Road Initiative. It's a stance of regional hegemony, indeed of regional bullying. It's, a, it's, a, it's an analogy about subordinating the region with military power, if not military force. Second part of the myth, China turned its back on the sea well, the reality is, those of you who know my work know that I work on the history of the Southeast Asian coast, of the Southeast China coast of Fujian. Um, and the people I work on would find it laughable if they were told that China had turned its back on the sea after, 13, after 1433. Uh, the people of South China continued to be very active internationally. I'm speaking, of course, about the Nanhai trade and the overseas Chinese. Until very, very late in the colonial period, the overseas Chinese and, and Chinese uh, travelers controlled most of uh, the trade through the region, uh, a much greater volume of trade until really very late than European colonial powers. This was an enormously productive um, uh, exchange between the people of South China and the people of Southeast Asia. It was productive in all kinds of ways. I could talk about music and art and and, and, and language and family structure and so on. Um, it was a small scale, uh, sorry, it was on a relatively small scale prior to European colonialism and on a massive scale after European colonialism reshapes the geopolitics of the region. But it took place without government involvement until, again, quite late, or not much Chinese government involvement. Uh, we're talking here about, to use the phrase that was coined by Wang Gongwu, merchants without empire. So the idea that, that's being evoked in the Zheng He mythology today about China turning its back on the sea should really be understood as a narrative of the Chinese state playing a relatively less central role in China's regional involvement. And therefore, and if, it follows, therefore, that Bri is about the Chinese state playing a, it's, it's, it's a call for greater state involvement and greater state control over the processes of engagement. Um, talking about the Chinese overseas in Southeast Asia, as I was doing a moment ago, raises a, a question. I'll just make this last comment and then close. Um, there is a lot of enthusiasm. I mean, one of the legacies of this period of history, of course, are the enormous millions strong communities of Huaqiao and Huayi 
uh, of overseas Chinese in Southeast Asia. There's a lot of enthusiasm in these communities for BRI, uh, for the initiative. The reality is that some people in the region will benefit, some overseas Chinese in the region will benefit, and many others will not. Some will be neutral for some, and it'll be negative for others. If history is any guide, which I'm sort of professionally obligated to say it is, <laughs> if history is any guide, then if Brie comes to be seen by the peoples of the region, and this is a point that, that Liz made a couple of times, if, the, if, if Brie comes to be seen uh, as threatening to the nations of Southeast Asia, the Chinese overseas living in these places will be at grave risk. Uh, Xi Jinping will not suffer personally if people in Indonesia turn against Bri. Chinese people living in Indonesia will. Um, the, the, and, and so I think sort of one conclusion that comes out of the analysis so far is that there are real risks uh, uh, associated with the project that, that need to be articulated because they certainly are not articulated in the Zhenghe Silk Road narrative. Liz has alluded to one, which is that China cannot avoid becoming enmeshed in regional conflicts, which it has so far avoided for the most part. The case that Liz cited, of course, is, is, the, is the, the China, the, the China-Pakistan corridor generates opposition from India, if that corridor proceeds, China becomes involved in new ways in the um, uh, regional tension in, in, in South Asia. Um, the other risk that I've kind of alluded to before is that, um, thank you, uh, is that by engaging in this expansion, um, China inevitably becomes involved in distributive questions within these societies. Uh, this is an idea that I, uh, 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 an insight that I learned from my colleague Meg Rithmeyer, who's sitting up there. Um, the, the, some people will gain from this project. Some people will gain from a railway being built and a port being built. Many people will suffer. Uh, within China, Deng Xiaoping was able to use the argument, a rising tide raises, raises all boats. Um, although he expressed it, uh, I've forgotten the exact phrase, but it was something along the lines of, uh, uh, it's okay if some people get rich first. Um, I'm very dubious that this logic will apply in the rest of the world. Um, some, a lot of people are going to be worse off, uh, and, and being told that Deng Xiaoping Li Lun solves your problems uh, a generation from now is not going to satisfy these people. Um, all right, let me just quickly conclude. Um, the kind of exercise that I, in which I've just engaged, that I, that I was inspired to do when Bill asked me to join this, this, this panel, usually aims to show the divergence of history from, or of myth from history. And usually the outcome is to show the kind of mythicness of myth, um, allowing us therefore to perhaps better understand the uh, true intentions of the people who are deploying the myth. Right? That's why you do the exercise, is you look at the myth, you look at where it differs from history, and then you say, aha, now we know a little bit more about who these, what the people who are making the myth really think. So again, that's originally what I intended to do when I was asked to join this panel. But it's occurred to me as I was preparing for it that the real finding is actually much more interesting. Um, there is, of course, a great divergence between the history of Zheng He and the myth of Bri. But there's also a quite startling convergence between the history of Zheng He and the reality of Bri. That is to say, the, the history of Zheng He, the real history of Zheng He, and the real story of Bri are potentially much closer than they, than they, than they appear. Invoking the myth of Zheng He, peaceful China turning, a, a peaceful emissary promoting prosperity and then China turning its back, is about de-emphasizing the Belt and Road Initiative as part of a larger project of power projection. And I think really we have to acknowledge that this larger project, the, we cannot 
um, uh, distinguish Brie from this larger project of power projection. And of course, this larger power project of power projection calls into question any purely economic or any purely altruistic narrative or myth. When we unpack the myth, we find the history quite disquieting. The historical precedents for Brie are modeled on a history of Chinese power projection in the region and of the Chinese state calling the shots. Awareness of this, I think, may put us in a better position to critically assess the likely consequences of this enormous project. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. Our uh, final panelist is Bill Overholt. I'm delighted to uh, follow my distinguished colleagues. I have to start out by uh, pointing out a, a fundamental difference between uh, what I'm going to say and, 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 and what they have said, uh, kind of trigger warning for students. <laughs> <laughs> if you write down on an exam what they have said, you'll get an A. If you write down what I'm about to say, you're guaranteed to f flunk your general exam in international relations. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to describe uh, Brie implausibly as an appropriation of US intellectual property that <laughs> potentially could pay dividends of trillions of dollars to the United States. Uh, let me step back. Uh, one of the very useful cliches I picked up as an undergraduate here was E.H. Carr's uh, description of history as a dialogue between the, the present and the past. And we're conducting kind of a dialogue between the present and the future here. Um, I want to analyze how that dialogue might appear to a student of national strategies, the strategies nations use to achieve their most important international objectives. Um, the world changed after World War II in a very f fundamental way that changed the kinds of international strategies that worked. Um, this is something that most of the political science profession hasn't picked up, but it's absolutely fundamental to understanding the post-war world. We learned for the first time that countries could grow seven to 10 percent a year. Uh, when countries learned to grow two percent a year, we called that the Industrial Revolution, and Britain took over half the world. When the Meiji Restoration made possible 4% growth in Japan. Japan became this huge power that almost took over great chunks of the world. U.S. Uh, position in the world is based on 3 to 4% growth. Uh, this economic transformation after World War II was comparable to the changes uh, created by the Industrial Revolution and, and the rise of the Japan and the United States. Uh, there was one other change that happened, and that was that military technology became so destructive that in most situations, the traditional use, uh, search for national power by using military power to seize your neighbor's territory <coughs> led primarily to Pyrrhic victories. I'm not talking just about nuclear weapons, but something our country is periodically rediscovering, or, or, or should. Uh, that, and this combination of the increasing value of economic strategies and the decreasing value of 
military focus strategy. I'm talking about a balance. I'm not talking about night and day here. Um, has set the context for both uh, the Cold War and uh, for Brie. Uh, what was the U.S. strategy after World War II? Uh, well, it had a, an important military component. We had a draw with the Soviet Union, but we had an economic strategy too. The economic strategy was the core. It was protected by the military, and it won the Cold War. The U.S. Uh, focused on reconstructing Europe and Japan and on creating a global network of development uh, based on a set of common institutions, uh, the Bretton Woods institutions, the IMF, the World Bank, Asian Development Bank, uh, World Trade Organization, which was originally GATT. Um, and we helped build infrastructure, uh, particularly in Europe and Japan, but then in a much wider area. Uh, we promoted common standards. Uh, we gave financial support, uh, and we provided we promoted open economies. And this created a self-sustaining, <coughs> growing global network, whereas the Soviet Union, which put all its resources into the military, like North Korea, uh, essentially went bankrupt. Uh, it's interesting, you can read whole histories of the Soviet collapse, like David Remnick's, and they forget this de detail that was basically a bankruptcy. Uh, so what was decisive was this economic uh, strategy, again, <coughs> vitally protected by the military. And Japan's unexpectedly great economic success as part of this network accelerated the success of the strategy in Northeast and Southeast Asia. The, the most distinctive outcome of that was the consolidation of peace and stability in Indonesia. Up until 1966, Indonesia was a divided, uh, violent, uh, economically hopeless, a uh, country that had the world's third largest communist party, and it had more violent jihadis than the rest of the world combined. And through uh, giving up Suharto's uh, geopolitical ambitions, which encompassed most of Southeast Asia, and focusing on economic development, uh, Indonesia became the core uh, the leader of Southeast Asia, and uh, gradually the government was able to negotiate a peaceful deal with the major Muslim groups, the, the Nadatul Ulama and Muhammadiyah. Um, and uh, it, it's interesting, it's useful to contrast that with the way contemporary strategy would handle that. We would be bombing them. And we would have been bombing them since 1966, and we'd still be losing. So phase one of this post-war development had some crucial outcomes. The Soviet Union was defeated economically. China was seduced economically. Uh, South Korea overshadowed. South Korea was hopeless through the 1960s. And now it completely overshadows North Korea. Uh, and revolutionary guerrilla warfare was defeated everywhere in Asia. Phase two I, of this process that the US started, I would describe as a U, US Chinese collaboration. Effectively, China joined the system 
There are all sorts of important footnotes to that that people in Washington argue about, but it joined the major institutions, it worked with them, it even accepted WTO's dispute settlement mechanism, which is the, the touchstone of accepting the system. This U.S.-Chinese joint uh, collaboration transformed the world economy and world politics. Uh, first, it created the super-industrial economy. For the first time in world history, we had more food, more toys, more clothes, more of all the essentials of life than, we, than the world actually needed. It was still maladistributed. There's still starving people in India and Africa. But we got, we got more toys than we need, and we got more clothes than we need. Fundamental transformation. Second, we moved into the post-industrial economy. The tipping point was 2015 when the Chinese economy became 50.5% services. Again, these are trends that were coming, but we weren't necessarily going to get to the tipping point. And the U.S.-Chinese <clears throat> parallel efforts created the tipping point. And this also is a crucial tripping point because it means we move from most people, in the, the majority of people in the world, doing back-breaking manual labor to doing service jobs like we have. Now, our politicians in America would tell you that going from manufacturing to services means going from the auto plant to McDonald's. But we all have service jobs, and Donald Trump has a service job. It's a good trend. It globalized prosperity. Uh, Africa and Latin America and the raw materials produces the world, the people who were starving for most of world history. Uh, became firmly part of the system. No longer did Brazil lead every, every uh, global economic crisis down. Uh, no longer did Africa go down whenever the system had a problem. Uh, it led to a globally integrated economy. It starts with integrating global supply chains for production. It's, it's integrated global finance. It's beginning to integrate global talent. Uh, and we're, we're right on the edge of a globalization of consumption, where in, instead of all the goods being produced in Asia and coming here, the center of, global, of gravity of global consumption is going to be in Asia. We've tipped into an environmentally conscious economy. Ten years ago, China was the biggest problem. Now it's the most environmentally driving economy in the world. They're digging out of a very deep hole, but they're digging the way Japan did in 1970 and the way London did in 1950. We've begun an era of a tremendous reduction in global inequality. Everybody talks about how inequality increases within countries. But almost all of the poor countries are growing at least twice as fast as the rich countries now. So dependency theory has lost. Um, the signature successes in this era, like, like Indonesia in the first era, are Bangladesh and Ethiopia. Bangladesh was the most hopeless place in the world when it was founded. Everybody knew that it was going to become kind of a jungle Somalia. And we could only expect that this failed state would be spreading jihadis all over the world. But the textile industry slopped over, first from Hong Kong and then from China. And Bangladesh became the world's second largest textile producer. All these women got jobs, and their, their kids had food. And guess what? They're, they're not spreading jihadis over the world. Ethiopia, the last time I worked there, had six Marxist-Leninist parties violently fighting each other. Hundreds of thousands of people were starving. Recently, it was the world's fastest growing economy. 
So phase one and phase two work pretty well, but there's been some backsliding with extreme oversimplification. For domestic, political, and de demographic reasons, Japan abandoned rapid economic reform, and it has sought national dignity uh, for 20 years from revisionist history and traditional nationalistic assertion. For domestic political reasons, the U.S. has abandoned uh, most of its economic, positive economic efforts and uh, uh, diplomatic uh, competence and has focused its national strategy completely on the military. And for largely domestic political reasons, China has become engaged in a series of maritime and India disputes. Uh, but and this, this headed us in a very bad direction, again, driven by domestic politics in each country, not, not by clear strategic thinking. The one hope is Bri. The areas that were left out of the success of the first two phases were Central Asia, the Middle East, and North Africa. BRI is an attempt to provide infrastructure, common standards, financial support, and more open economies, uh, very much like Washington's strategy uh, in the uh, middle of the last century. Uh, doesn't have the institutional building and the ideological drive that Washington had. We, we want push democracies everywhere. China's not doing that. And the institutional building was very valuable. It was crucial, for instance, for helping Indonesia. But like the U.S. in the second half of the 20th century, China has become the one country with an integrated national strategy. China has become the pragmatic, non-ideological promoter of growth. Uh, China is the vision leader in economic integration and the vision leader on climate change and the environment. Very inspiring vision. How's the vision going to work out? Well, a lot of problems. Uh, huge financial commitments, huge hubris. Uh, China's just spending money the way Japan was spending in the, in, in the 1980s, uh, as if there's no tomorrow. Um, there are some financial limits out there. Uh, state enterprise reform could make, lack of state enterprise reform could make it very difficult to, to deliver on a lot of these projects. It's supposed to be a commercial venture, not a Marshall Plan, but $46 billion of projects in Pakistan. Um, I, I worked for investment banks for 21 years, and anybody who can find $46 billion worth of credit work projects in Pakistan is a better investor a better banker than anybody I've ever met. A geopolitical resistance is uh, uh, going to be a problem. Um, diversion of resources into purely military projects is seem, seems to be happening in Sri Lanka. Uh, eventually, there's going to be a, a military challenge because uh, the jihadis and others in the Middle East are going to be about as happy with BRI as they are with U.S. Uh, policies. So the, the prospects of BRI without other bigger, big power support are probably not very good. How's that going to work out? Well, I think Europe is going to turn out to be pretty supportive. Uh, they're not endorsing it in a big big policy statements, but project by project by project, there's money here. Uh, Japan is warily interested. The U.S. doesn't know what to think. <laughs> it's, hard, it's hard to oppose the vision and a lot of particular projects. Uh, at the same time, there's kind of a mentality that if, if it's good for China, it must be bad. 
Um, this is a military mentality. Economist mentality is win-win. Military mentality is anybody, anything that helps the other guy uh, must be bad for us. Uh, this, was, this is what led the U.S. to stay out of and oppose the AIIB, the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, which everybody today, everybody serious agrees was a terrible mistake. But we could make that mistake on a scale a thousand times larger. Uh, U.S. companies that engage will make profits compared to how well they do. If, as I would expect, a combination of military protection and spread of this kind of de development process through North Africa, the, the Middle East, Central Asia, I would expect to, to earn trillions of dollars of uh, dividends for the U.S. in military expenditures that we won't have uh, over a 50-year period, not, not next year. If the U.S. stays out, if it goes protectionist in the Trump-Bernie Sanders, uh, Chuck Schumer mode, uh, we're going to miss out on the core of the consumer economy of the rest of the century, which is not the American baby boom generation. It's, it's the, uh, the 25-year-old Chinese. Uh, let me stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bill. It occurs to me, listening to these three um, fascinating presentations, um, what a challenge it is to figure out at any historical era how we best characterize it, whether we're talking about the era of the ancient Silk Road, of uh, the uh, 15th century maritime exploration, or of the post-World War II, or contemporary period. And in thinking about the future possibilities of Brie, um, presumably they will be heavily dependent on whether we really are living through what later we will interpret as a time of globalization or primarily a time of increasing isolation and protectionism and so forth. I think we don't know the answer to that. We're living in a moment of post-Brexit uh, and uh, the future of the European Union is threatened by that. We're living in a time where the U.S. has withdrawn from the Paris Climate Agreement and the Pacific Trade Partnership. Um, and um, so in some ways, it seems like a moment of isolationism, of rising nationalism, of anti-globalization. And yet, uh, we see these growing communications networks, these growing uh, economic networks networks as well. So um, a lot to think about here, and uh, we have uh, 20 or so minutes to invite questions from the audience. I think I'll take uh, a number of questions. If you could uh, first very, very uh, briefly indicate who you are, and then direct your question to one or more of the panelists, and please make your question very brief. And we'll take several questions uh, at once and then go back to the panelists for their answers. So up here in the back first. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. My name is Yuling. I have a Harvard PhD in history of science. So uh, I have two very simple related questions. First, uh, the one built, one road is a proposal or a plan. Uh, yet Silk Road is a historical his existence. Namely, it is formed, it was formed by history, just like the Mon Mongolian Empire. I don't think uh, Genghis Khan uh, ever planned the empire. So my question is that, is uh, could anything similar to Silk Road be planned? Secondly, uh, China was certainly the center of the Silk Road. Uh, people all go to China, put in a very simple way, for silk. If the one built, one road is plan is to be carried out, what would people go to China for? Okay, thank you very much. Next. Oh, God. <laughs> 
Yeah, <clears throat> my name is Tom Simons. I'm a retired U.S. diplomat, former ambassador to Pakistan. Uh, my question is about Russia. I suppose it's to uh, Professor uh, Elliot as the inner Asia man because the geographic center of the of the new project has to be Central Asia. Uh, Central Asia uh, in this century has been part of the Soviet Union, uh, Russia. Russia would like to continue to uh, dominate that area and it seems to me that China is is buying it. I mean, is really cleaning Russia's clock. Uh, Professor Perry was eloquent about Indian uh, disquiet about it. I, I'd like to hear about how Russia is responding uh, to this major change in its uh, geopolitical prospects. Thank you. you have... Oh my God. Thanks. Um, my name is Mingye. I teach at Boston University. Uh, um, I have uh, uh, two two points. One is question. One is observation. The first one is um, uh, the Belt Road. Uh, the governing structure uh, is uh, the National Development and Research Commission, so NDRC, which is deeply economic and developmental. And uh, in my own field of research, I worked through the local governments uh, along the road, and I observed so many uh, economic uh, development related uh, 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 projects, programs inside China, and uh, interviews with uh, companies as well. It's hard to say this is not a developmental project and the, the and I, I i think it's it's hard to say it's not a domestic development driven project um uh, the, so on this sense I, I i think i echo more with uh, with dr overhaul um the second uh, is the question uh, i first heard of the one by one road in late 2013 and unlike professor Elliot, i thought right right that moment this was going to be a lasting project. Uh, <laughs> and the person who told me was uh, a strategist. Uh, and then the reason uh, it was uh, important to him, and I agree, was the sense of local governments, the ruling elites felt excited about this project. So China Dream or the other slogans didn't excite you, but the new Silk Road excites them. So this comes down to the, the myth that our historian colleagues uh, emphasized on. So the myth it is it's untrue, right? Uh, but uh, if, the, if a, a program is so justified by the myth and uh, uh, it becomes a kind of elite belief, uh, how this will affect the, the real policy uh, implementation. And this will be to uh, Professor Elliot and uh, Sony. Thank you. Uh, yes, right over here. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Sophia Chu. I am a graduate of School of Public Health. Uh, I am not trained in your uh, expertise areas. Um, however, I'm very deeply interested in um, issues related, related to uh, China and the US. I have two questions. Um, the first question is directed to Dr. Overholt. Um, I'm curious to know what is your thought on the engagement between engagement of US um, in uh, Bree's delivery um, in terms of using the term that was mentioned earlier in the presentation, merchants without state or merchants without, um, I, I guess, a, a country, or, or and how would individual enterprises and uh, companies, uh, how are they approaching Bree from the US uh, now, and what do you see the uh, trend of that uh, engagement going forward uh, in the future. The other, the second question I have is regarding the idea of synchronization and how that is carried. Uh, is um, this is qu this question is more directly towards uh, Professor Elliot and Professor Songi. If you feel um, the uh, synchronization process is being delivered through Brie, and um, and what I really mean is the idea at least in my interpretation, the idea of um, there's, you are a Chinese, the idea of being a Chinese. Either this is applies to overseas Chinese or Chinese who are going abroad right now or, um, or uh, Chinese who are residing domestically within China. So thank you. 
Thank you. Nothing from over here? <laughs> it's, on the stairs, it's almost right? over. Yes, right on the stairs. Yes. Uh, good afternoon. My question is to Professor Perry. I am Madhurendra Western I'm not Fellow a at panelist. Uh, I'm just okay. a chair. <laughs> okay, so uh, uh, then I don't know whom to <laughs> because uh, it's ahead. related Go to ahead. India. Yeah. Uh, it is true that India didn't formally participate in the uh, BRF uh, held in May. Uh, and during that time, one of the concerns that was raised uh, during the conversations that Indian academicians and uh, even diplomats had that uh, it is because China is building the corridor, the China-Pakistan economic corridor in the disputed area, which is a disputed area between India and Pakistan. And then uh, there was another uh, suggestion that China should at least change the name of this economic corridor. Now, if it is true and if it is logical, how will that help India become a supporter of, how will that help India change its mind into becoming a supporter of One Belt, One Road and maybe join this initiative in the future? Thank you. I, I will defer to uh, the uh, experts on India. Would you like to answer that, uh, Shugata? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm, uh, my name is Gao Zhan Jun, a visiting fellow uh, at Kennedy School. I have two questions. Um, first, uh, it's very interesting that Professor Elliot and Michael talk different people in their presentation. And uh, Professor Elliot starts from Zhang Qian and finishes with Zhang Qian. And uh, Professor Zoni starts from Zhenghe, finishes with Zhenghe. I'm very curious uh, why Professor Elliot uh, didn't choose to talk about Zhenghe and Professor Zoni did not choose to talk about <laughs> Zhang Qian. <laughs> I'm not sure if this question is fair enough, but I'm just getting the sense that the audience might be curious about the answer. That's my first question. The second one is for Professor Overhold. Uh, now we can see very clearly from the estimates of World Bank, ADB, and such international organizations that there is a huge gap between the infrastructure demand and the shortage of the ability to build those infrastructures. Do you think that a more closer cooperation among countries is a better way to deal with this problem? Or is ORB, ORD is a better way, is an alternative to solve uh, this problem? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, James, if you could give the microphone to Professor Bose, who can answer my, the question that was directed at me, and then we'll turn back to okay. the real panelists uh, to answer the questions that were directed at them. find somebody else in the audience. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, I'll turn my answer into a question for Bill, I think. There were two views in India uh, as to whether uh, India uh, should uh, go to the, uh, the BARF uh, summit or not. Uh, and it was the government which decided in its wisdom at the end that it would not go at all. Uh, those who argued in favor of some level of participation um, pointed out that uh, the United States was going to be there, Japan was going to be there, Vietnam was going to be there. Uh, all of these countries have uh, certain disagreements with, uh, with China. So um, there was a position in India which held that one could register one's protest on the sovereignty question uh, with the CPEC going through Pakistan occupied Kashmir and yet you know not uh, you know completely stay away from what is going to be a huge infrastructure and connectivity uh, project uh, so uh, I think India's position is that it is generally speaking in favor of building closer connections across Asia uh, uh, certainly the maritime routes, you will see from the Merix map, there is one place in India which finds uh, mention, which is Kolkata, as a terminus of both one of the land routes and, 
a, a maritime route. So there is interest in being part of a larger Asian sort of project of building you know, closer connections. So the way that I want to pose this now for Bill is that could India have made a mistake by you know, not showing up at some level uh, in May 2017 at the Belt and Road uh, Forum in the same way that you suggest the United States made a mistake by not joining a AIIB. Uh, you know, we, we live in an era where we could flag a sovereignty question and yet try to uh, participate in projects which will build connections across uh, borders. So I'll leave it uh, at that. Thanks. Thank you very much. I know we have lots more questions, but we uh, are short on time and there will be a reception right afterwards. So I'm going to return now to the panelists and ask each of them to just take a couple of minutes to respond to those questions that they would like to, beginning with Bill and then just moving in this direction. Okay. Um, I'll start with the question about, about Russia. Um, Russia made a critical mistake in the the uh, Cold War era of uh, putting all its resources into the military and and uh, neglecting its economy. Uh, uh, the result was pretty obvious to somebody who looked. I actually gave a a briefing to the National Security Council in the White House in May of 1977, saying that this long-term trends. Uh, of the Soviet Union were headed for collapse. You can make that same prediction today. And uh, uh, the Soviet Union is gradually becoming a quarry for China. Uh, uh, they're in demographic and every kind of economic decline. Uh, it's going to collapse and it's going to be, pro uh, there's going to be a reaction uh, 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 among others against China. So it's going to be a big bump for the for the uh, BRI, U.S. Enterprises in the BRI. Um, uh, U.S. Enterprises, as you know, uh, go seeking money wherever they can find it. Uh, uh, they are very disinclined these days to, uh, uh, to engage in more large-scale collaboration with Chinese projects because uh, the, the unequal uh, application of competition policy and of uh, technological requirements to turn over uh, their technology for security and other reasons. A uh, whole, whole host of, of, uh, of complaints. Uh, uh, interestingly, the Japanese have a different view, but, but by and large, Europeans, Japanese, and Americans are very unhappy about the way business in China and with Ch major Chinese entities is going. Um, uh, on infrastructure, I think OBOR is the right way to go, or BRI. Uh, China was uh, granting uh, some $600 billion worth of, of uh, uh, help with projects. Uh, uh, and they uh, unilaterally, and what they discovered was that it, it would probably be much more efficient for them if they channeled this through a multilateral uh, program uh, uh, with institutions uh, uh, parallel to the World Bank and the ADB, but much bigger. Uh, uh, U.S. doubts about the AIIB were silly. Uh, I knew Jin Lee Jun long before he was formally appointed. Uh, they want to do everything just as well as the World Bank, but a lot faster. Uh, and a lot faster would be a lot better for the world. So I, I, think, I think OBOR in collaboration with the ADB uh, and and uh, the World Bank and so on uh, is the right way to go. Uh, did India make a BARF mistake? Uh, yes. Uh, every country along China's periphery has major 
problems. And China's engaged in economic warfare against the Philippines, against South Korea. Uh, at the same time, it's trying to pull them into uh, all these projects. Uh, but being part of the, the, the institutional uh, financial inf infrastructure and, and having a voice in creating these, these uh, almost global networks uh, is worth a lot. You, you, have to, you have to jump in and make all your complaints and defend your interests, uh, but push forward. And that's, that was the attitude of many countries toward the World Bank and the IMF too. Uh, the, the, there are a lot of complaints and a lot, a lot of dislike of the way Washington manipulated them for its own purposes. But you needed to be there. Uh, that's my view. Thank you. Uh, Michael? Um, well, I'll quickly answer that gentleman's question. Um, I think both our pre presentations were supply-driven rather than demand-driven. <laughs> <laughs> we, we talked about the things we know about uh, and tried to apply them to the question, to, to the question at hand. Um, the... Uh, the um, there are a couple of things you can ask about um, about politically driven myths or politically useful myths. Obviously, as, as Min points out, one of the questions is, why these myths and not others? Um, you can try to show uh, why the myths are. So th there is actually a, a, a quite narrow and specific um, uh, political function of myth dismantling. You can show how um, the myth being wrong has consequences for contemporary political questions. Um, in, in the Zheng He case, I didn't talk about this one, but this is the connection between Zheng He and the South China Sea disputes. Um, Zheng He is often invoked uh, in, in conversations about why China has uh, territorial, why Chinese territorial claims on these islands are justified. Um, the reality, of course, is that Zheng He stayed as far away from the South China Sea as he could. Um, first of all, because there were no people there, so they were useless to him. And secondly, because if you don't have good navigational tools, you don't take sailborne ships into reefs. Right? So we know actually that he didn't go there. So we can dismantle the myth in a, in a way that, that, uh, that, that addresses a specific historical or a, spef a specific contemporary political question. I think what I was trying to do um, was uh, uh, was look at mythology in another way, um, which is to suggest that these myths and their content and why they're attractive can help us think a little bit more about um, how different actors in the region are going to respond to the changing world. Um, the, the reality is that um, Brie or no Brie, uh, the, the, the Chinese power in the region is going to grow on, 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 you know, for, for purely economic reasons. Um, the infrastructure built or not built, and just quickly on, a, on, your, on, on the Merchants Without Empires comment, I realize that infrastructure is a distinctive form of uh, investment, um, but if there aren't $49 billion worth of productive uh, cost, uh, what was the term you used? Uh, Creditworthy project. credit worthy projects in in uh, in Pakistan. I would guess that uh, a merchants without empires, whether they are Chinese or American, will do a better job at identifying which are the credit worthy ones than a bank based in Be in Beijing. Um, but the reality is that sorry to, to come back to the larger point. The reality is that all of the countries in the region are going to need to, and the United States are going to need to deal with a changing balance of, of, of power in the region. Um, and I think thinking about why the Zheng He stories are told in the way they are told, uh, why they resonate with some leaders and not with others, and the real history behind those myths uh, might be productive in thinking about that future. Thanks very much. Mark? So I'll, uh, I'll be brief. We are, we are already at, uh, at time. Uh, lots of questions. Can anything similar to the Silk Road actually be planned? It's a great question, and I guess we'll find out the answer, <laughs> uh, is, uh, is, is what I would have to say uh, uh, to that. As to what, the, if I understood the second part of your question correctly, the, the uh, uh, equivalent, what, what, what is it that is taking Silk's place 
on the on the modern Silk Road, and I guess I would have to say it's it's Chinese cash, U.S. <laughs> U.S. debt, uh, uh, you know, some combination uh, that uh, of, of of those things. It's the uh, 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 remarkable uh, um, skill uh, and. Uh, professionalism that has contributed to so many of the infrastructure projects that Chinese companies have undertaken around the world. Uh, where uh, Many places where we, we travel now in, in the developing world, the new airports and the new roads have been built by Chinese companies, and many of them look pretty nice, uh, especially compared to some old American airports. So uh, I think that you know, there, there are definite benefits uh, to, to, um, uh, to that. Um, I do think there is a major balance of power issue at hand here, and the Russia part is the other major question, along with the the the, the India Pakistan question as as well. Um, you know, in the 19th century, when uh, there was this famous debate at the Qing court about whether to make the uh, investment in reconquering the West, uh, the territories that later became formalized as the province of Xinjiang. Uh, or to uh, focus on the maritime frontier, uh, ultimately the court uh, decided to finance the uh, continental uh, reconquista, uh, which is effectively what it was, and it was uh, derided by many at the time as a complete waste and bad idea, kind of a Seward's folly sort of a thing. And now uh, that policy and Zhou Zongtang, the general who uh, uh, led the forces from mostly from Hunan province, that reconquered Xinjiang is regarded as a, a genius move. Uh, this has put China in an excellent position geopolitically. Uh, and indeed, the, the question about who, uh, who is going to receive uh, the deeper bows when it comes to uh, uh, delegations visiting in Central Asia, the Russians or the Chinese, is, is an open question for the moment. The, the lingua franca of the region remains Russian, as you know. Uh, I think looking to see at what point uh, Chinese language ability starts to tip the other way will be one index. Uh, same for India, where there's virtually nobody learning Chinese these days, although the Harvard Yanjing Institute is doing its part to try and build up China expertise. But that's, um, that, that, that's another question, I suppose. Um, I'll just end, there are lots of other questions here, but on the, the uh, uh, notion of, of the excitement generated. Uh, clearly, you, you saw this much clearly, more clearly than I did, uh, and uh, uh, you know, I guess I was uh, overcome by the, uh, the, the irony that I, I perceived, uh, the belief that the actual history would, would matter, uh, <laughs> would, would, would prevent people from taking this too seriously. Uh, I maybe that I had a I, I had a PhD student at the time whose work was showing that in fact there was never anything like the Silk Road, that the the uh, volume of trade that actually happened on the Silk Road was very very small, that the documents based on the documents that we've got in uh, from Dunhuang and other places, most of the movement on the Silk Road was diplomatic, and most of the goods that moved were gifts. There, was no, there were no huge caravans with lots and lots of, of, of things moving back and forth. It was not what we imagined. But I think you ask a good question is, well, yeah, that, maybe that matters to us historians, and it, it will matter on one level for sure. But in terms of the, ex, like as you say, the excitement, the um, interest that this has generated, uh, and the uh, ways in which the this, this Silk Road idea uh, whether it's the continental or maritime or wherever it goes, um, in um, serving as a, a, a place where things can be projected successfully, uh, that seems to be undiminished, and myth probably helps that more than it hurts it. Thank you very much. Uh, please join me in thanking these three panelists for terrific <laughs> presentation. And so, thanks to all of you for great questions. I'd just like to um, reiterate, echo those thanks to Professor Perry, Elliot, Zoni, and Dr. Overholt. Thank you to the staff of the Asia Center, the Fairbanks Center, and our other Asia-related centers for making this event possible. And thank you to the other Asia-related centers here. That's the Fairbanks Center, the Reischauer Institute for Japanese Studies, the Korea Institute, 
and the South Asia Institute for co-sponsoring this event. Again, this is Asia beyond the headlines, so Asia writ large. There's a reception, as we've said, and hopefully we'll see many of you back on October 27 when we discuss nuclear issues and security in the Korean Peninsula and beyond in Northeast Asia. So thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.